Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Michael Ling Duclef and Heidi Stevens. Thanks for attending. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 125 videos of past events archived on our website and on our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now for formal introductions. Michael Ling Duclef is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Hunt Gather Parent, What Ancient Cultures Can Teach Us About the Lost Art of Raising Happy, Helpful Little Humans. Dr. Duclef is a global health correspondent for an NPR's Science Desk, where she re mm -hmm. Sorry, I have a typo here, where she reports for the radio and web about disease outbreaks and children's health. Sorry about that. In 2015, Dr. Duclef was part of the team that earned a George Foster Peabody Award for its coverage of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. As a science journalist, she has reported on a broad range of topics from vaccination fears and the microbiome to beer biophysics and dog psychology. Uh, obviously, we need to book you again on both those topics. Uh, Heidi. Stevens, uh, who we adore, uh, writes a daily column for the Chicago Tribune, where she has worked since 1998. Her nationally syndicated columns reach more than a million print and online readers each day, appearing in newspapers across the country. She's a frequent guest on local and national TV and radio stations, where she's called upon to discuss current events, pop culture, and issues around gender, race, and relationships. She also records a weekly podcast with family therapist, Dr. John Duffy, who appeared for FAN in 2020, who we also were a huge fan of him. The name of the podcast is On Purpose, so make sure you go take a look for it. And now, with no further ado, let's welcome Michaeline Duclef and Heidi Stevens. Thank you. Hi, Michaeline. Hi, Heidi. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, you're in California, right? Yes, I'm in San Francisco, where it's still still early. Yeah, right. How's the weather? It's beautiful. We've had a heat wave, and and that means that it's like 70s and San, 70s and 80s in San Francisco, which is very wow. hot for us. Yes. Yeah, for June. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, well, I'm so excited for this conversation tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Fan, for for having me, and Heidi for for doing this. Of course. I think um, you're going to start us off with a little bit of an excerpt from your book. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm going to start off um, kind of where I began uh, this whole journey that ended up being this book. Um, NPR had sent me down for a, a story about paying attention to a small uh, village, Mayan village in the Yucatan. And when I got there, I quickly realized that there was a much bigger story in this village, um, a much bigger story all around the world than just about how kids pay attention. Um, I just spent about three or four days, you know, interviewing moms and dads and and and, wa and watching them, watching them with their kids. And this is kind of where 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 I was in that moment. Um, and I actually wrote this down right when I got to the airport in um, in in Cancun because it, it was such a such an important moment for me. And I knew it was important, even though it would, it would be like four more years before I wrote this book. Um, what, I, what I had witnessed blew my mind. The parenting approach was totally different than anything I'd ever seen. It was different than the methods used by the Uber moms back in San Francisco, different than what I had experienced as a child and 180 degrees away from what I was raising, the way I was raising my daughter, Rosie. My own parenting style was like a white knuckled ride on class five rapids with drama, screaming and tears galore, not to mention the endless rounds of negotiating and bickering on both sides. With the Maya moms, on the other hand, I felt like I was on a wide serene river, meandering through a mountain valley, smooth and steady in its flow, gentle, easy, and very little drama. I saw no screaming, no bossing around in either direction and little nagging. And yet their parenting was effective, Oh, so effective. The children were respectful, kind, and cooperative, not just with their mom and dad, but also with their siblings. Heck, half the time, the parents didn't even need to ask a child to share a bag of chips with a younger sibling. The child did so voluntarily. But what really stood out was the children's helpfulness. Everywhere I went, I saw kids of all ages, ages eagerly helping their parents. 
A nine-year-old girl hopped off her bike and ran over to turn on a watering hose for her mom. A four-year-old girl volunteered to run to the corner market to pick up some tomatoes with the promise of a piece of candy, of course. And then on the final morning of my visit, I witnessed the ultimate act of helpfulness. And it came from an unlikely source, a preteen girl on spring break. I was sitting in the family's kitchen talking to the girl's mother, Maria de los Angeles Tumburgas, as she cooked black beans over a coal fire. With her long black hair tied in a sleek ponytail, Maria had on a navy A-line dress cinched at the waist. The two older girls are still sleeping, Maria said, as she, as she sat to rest on a hammock. The previous night, the girls had stayed up late to watch a scary shark movie, and I found them all in one hammock at midnight huddled up together, she said, laughing softly and smiling. So I'm permitting them to sleep more. Maria works extremely hard. She handles all the household chores, makes all the meals, and helps with family, the family's business. And no matter what chaos whirled around her during our visit, Maria was always cool as a cucumber. Even when she admonished her youngest daughter, Alexa, not to touch the coal fire, she spoke in a calm voice and her face remained relaxed. We chatted for a few more minutes. And then as I stood up to leave, Maria's 12-year-old daughter, Angela, emerged from her bedroom. Wearing black capris, a red t-shirt and gold hoop earrings, she looked just like a preteen in California. But she did something I had never seen in California. She walked right past me and her mom and without saying a word, grabbed a tub of soapy water and started cleaning the dishes from breakfast. No one had asked her to start washing, no chore chart hung on the wall. In fact, as we'll learn, chore charts may actually inhibit such voluntary acts. Instead, Anhala simply noticed the dirty dishes sitting in the sink and got to work, even though she was on spring break from school. <laughs> We can stop there. <laughs> Everyone's getting uh, pencils and paper to start taking notes at this point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as soon as you said dishes. <laughs> but that's not the only place you traveled. So talk about um, the, the places that you traveled for the research of this book. Yeah, so after I went to the Yucatan, I actually got sent up um, by NPR again. I, I didn't think about writing a book because I really at that point thought, it was something kind of specific to the Maya, Maya families or even that community um, naively. And then I, I, I was sent back up to, I was sent up to the Arctic to a little town called Iqaluit. And I actually, um, when is kind of a similar thing, um, of course things are very different. It's a very different environment, but the parenting style was incredibly similar to the Maya, Maya parenting style and that it was calm, very respectful of the children. And the children um, were, were, respectful back. They were very calm and kind and generous and helpful. And I started, I was kind of shocked. I was like, wait, these are very different people, groups that have been separated in time for thousands of years. And yet you could see this very powerful thread of parenting between the two groups. And so when I, when I got back, I started researching about it and I started to realize that actually this is a very common way of parenting around the world and throughout human history. Um, and actually come, you know, not that long ago, elements of it were in Western and European culture. Um, and that's when I really decided that this should be a book and that I wanted to learn more because I felt like this is something that's, um, that ties a, a lot of humanity together. And I also think that there's really good evidence archeologically, evolutionarily, um, that, that this is probably the way that kids evolved and the parent-child relationship evolved to work over like um, tens of thousands, even hundred thousands of years. And so I thought that there was something really powerful here that we were kind of missing, that we, in a, a lot of parents in America were missing out on. Yeah, definitely. So before we talk about what you learned on your travels and how we might all want to um, possibly adjust and, and calibrate what we're doing. Let's talk a little bit about how we ended up with some of the parenting messaging, right, that we're all surrounded by. Um, you talked to some cross-cultural psychologists who coined the acronym WEIRD, right? Yes. W-E-I-R-D, the word we all know, WEIRD. Um, explain WEIRD to us. Yeah, so WEIRD comes from um, a researcher group at British Columbia, but one of the guys has moved to Harvard. Um, and what they did was they went and they looked at 
what does psychology, who does psychology actually study? So if you look at psychological research, um, this was done about 10 years ago and I was just reading up on it and it hasn't changed very much, unfortunately. But if you look at psychological research, about 96% of it is performed on people from what they call weird backgrounds. So Western, highly educated, E is educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. Um, so we're, we're talking about white middle class, right? White middle upper class, a lot of times in college towns. So very specific people. And the rest, is, and that's about probably at most 12% of the world's population. And so only like 4% of psychological studies are done on, you know, 80, almost 80% 80 of the world, um, and which is fine. If you want to study white middle class people, that's great, right? <laughs> the problem is, is that then when you try to extrapolate to something that's like a human universal, you can't make that jump, right? Because what they actually found was that this weird group of people behaves differently or uniquely or weird compared to a lot of the rest of the world. So um, we actually do something, weird people actually do, do stuff that is kind of strange compared to the way the rest of the world does things um, on these psychological experiments. And even things as simple as seeing two lines. So visual perception, um, weird people have a are fooled by optical illusions that non-weird groups aren't. Um, but for our purposes, it, we can really look at parenting. And um, if you analyze the way, the kind of the common dominant approach to parenting and the way that the media and science, you know, um, promotes, if you look at this way of parenting, it is incredibly weird. It, um, there's about 50 or 60 things that we think are kind of standard or even really good that you can't find anywhere else in the world. Um, and probably not throughout human history as well. Um, and a lot of times we think these things are normal or we think that they're scientifically backed, but in fact, the science is often really, really thin. And then if it is stronger, it's backed by this very weird science, right? That's really focused on um, a very slim part of the population. And so the problem with this is that we're missing a huge amount of, of the parenting ideas out there, right? Yeah. We're, we're seeing parenting through this tiny keyhole of, of what we think is right. And there's just incredible amounts of, of tools and tips and advice, stuff that really works, stuff that parents, you know, in very different parts of the world have turned to over and over again. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to do with this book is like, start to kind of open that view up a little bit and say, Ooh, let's, let's, let's learn. Let's learn about other approaches and, and try, try them out and see if they work. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't just turn to sort of the conventional experts, advice givers books, you will get more than just this, you know, quote unquote, weird perspective, right? Yeah. yeah. And it becomes I, kind of a little bit of an echo chamber, I think, because mm -hmm. it's kind of like, well, this is the way we do it. And this is the way science tells us. Um, but actually, a lot of what we do is not science backed at all. It is really, really hard, you know, to for science to tell us how to uh, you know, help our children behave, like so sociology, right? It's, a, it's very challenging for science to, you know, to tell us how to stop a tantrum or teach children to be to help be helpful. One of the psychologists told me, you know, it's easier to send a person to Mars than to have science tell you how to parent. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if you actually look at the source and the origin of where a lot of the stuff we, we do, it actually comes from these pamphlets written in the um, 18th and 19th century by doctors in Europe who were trying to kind of industrialize um, child raising. And they even explicitly say, take it out of the hands of women and into the men of sense. Um, but there are these little pamphlets. They were like the first original parenting books. And if you go back and read these parenting books, you can kind of find the some of the the core elements of what we think of as really good parenting come from these, these pamphlets. Um, and then they just kind of got recycled over and over again by experts and parenting people. They are not traditional wisdom or, um, or science, science backed as we might, we might think. Yeah, and not all that time or history tested, really, right? When you're no, the, no, <laughs> like a flash. Yeah. Right, yeah. a flash, exactly. So one of the things you talk about is how Western parents employ um, two types of motivation, right? Praise or punishment, where in other cultures, parents tap into a child's drive to fit in with their family, to belong, right? Yes, yes, um, huge. 
Yeah, that struck me as huge. And you also write that kids are wired for cooperation. Um, and one of the traits that, that makes us human, in fact, is that it feels good um, you know, to work together and help people who love us. So, so talk about that and, and how to build on that. Yeah, I think this is huge. I mean, we talk, we talk a lot about peer pressure, right, that kids have. Um, and peer pressure is an incredible motivating factor for kids, right, as they get older and in school. But we don't actually take advantage of that motivation in the home very much. <laughs> in fact, we don't even really, I didn't really, really realize it existed until I started reading about it. Um, but yes, yeah, so if you look at um, other primates, you know, in the world, and and you talk to evolutionary biologists, they uh, there is a strong belief, and there's a lot of evidence to support this idea that what made Homo sapiens um, so successful. So you know, there's ha a handful, even like a dozen, more than a dozen different Homo species that existed like a million years ago or five hundred thousand years ago, and these did not survive. Um, and something was unique and special about Homo sapiens that allowed us to survive and beat out these other um, pr advanced primates. And people will say like big brains and people will say like bipedalism, but all those things actually a lot of these other species had. What these species didn't have was what you just said, is this incredible drive and skill at cooperating. Um, and, and people think that this is actually really what's key to, to our success as, as a species. Um, and, and this actually fits with a lot of psychological research on toddlers. So toddlers are all over the world, no matter where you are, toddlers want to help. And they're actually incredibly skilled at it. So for instance, if there's these experiments, these incredible experiments where they take like 18 month olds and, you know, and, and somebody will drop something and the child will automatically help and pick it up you know, or somebody will be walking and something will be in the way of the person intentionally, but the child doesn't know that. The child will actually move it out of the way. So they have like a six different things that these 18 month olds do voluntarily. Um, and if you look, there's a lot of examples, right? Like two years, three years, we say it, they love to help. They want to help. <laughs> and there's things that we do in Western culture and we, the weird culture that actually um, psychologists think extinguish this. It actually erodes it. And so by the time kids reach about six or seven or eight, they start to diverge from other kids in the world. Whereas a lot of kids in the world will continue to be helpful, continue mm -hmm. to want to help voluntarily, and they'll start to become skilled at it, right? Because they're starting to become competent and, you know, they'll start to be able to cook. They'll start to be able to take care of siblings. They'll start to be able to, you know, really grow things or butcher a pig. I mean, the list goes on and on. Whereas yeah. in weird cultures, it, the, the desire to help starts to go away. And so the first section of this book is really about trying to fan that flame and keep that flame alive so that you have a six, seven, eight, nine, 12 year old who continues to wanna to help and then is competent to do it. And a big, big part of that, Heidi, is what you talked about, is this idea of harnessing this group motivation. This, yeah. I want to help my family, I want to, and that's why the little ones want to do it. They want to help that they know that you love them and you're taking care of them and they want to give back, you know? Right. Um, and so there's some things that you can do to, 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 to harness that and keep that flame alive. And then there's some things that we do that tends to kind of blow it, blow it out. But I have to say, this is what everyone asks me. It, it doesn't matter how old you are, that flame is in you. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it is in there. I yeah. think, you know, even adults, I say I use these methods on adults, even adults that don't know how to be helpful. There's a term, a uh, Spanish term, accomodido, which means pay, paying attention to the world around, to the people around you and then helping where it's needed. So Angela in the, in the part I read is accomodido. She saw accomodida. She saw the dishes and she went and did it. And there's, there's adults in my life that aren't a comedito. <laughs> and I have used these methods to, 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 to help. And I realize I'm not always that way. And, and it's helped me learn to be more that way. Um, yeah. Well, and it seemed like a lot of what you reported um, in both your observations and in the way you calibrated and how you parent Rosie is just not stopping someone immediately if they're doing someone usually being a child um not stopping them if they're doing it in a way that isn't the exact way you would have or in a way that is 
actually in, 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 a, in a little bit of a sense going to add more time to your day because you're going to have to clean up after them a little bit or, you know, or um, possibly ho hopefully when they're not looking correct the way they yeah. <laughs> chopped yeah. a vegetable or something. But, but often we, we stop the helping um, because we think, oh, they're doing it wrong or, oh, they're going to hurt themselves or, um, oh, that's not how I like it done. And there, it's really valuable to stop yourself from doing that, right? And, and allow the helping to take shape and allow the child to see himself or herself as a true helper and also a true family member, right? Yeah, this is really huge. You kind of already hit on like the huge components of it. So one is, is, is I think a story is a good idea here. So like, there's actually a study that just came out a couple months ago. It's not in this book because it just came out, but where the, the researchers give moms a scenario. So a little two, three-year-old comes over while the, while the mom's doing the laundry and starts throwing the laundry all around the room, which is, you know, <laughs> and she at, they asked the, the European American moms, you know, what, what do you think? And what do you do? And, and, and they say, you know, well, I'm mad. You're making a big mess. And like, I tell them to go play and I try to finish the laundry because they just want to play. And so the, the mom sees the motivation, the child's motivation as like, I want to play, I want to make a mess, right? And so she shoes the child away. Um, then they asked, I think this is actually my, my Maya moms and not the same town, but nearby, you know, what do you think? And the mom says, well, I'm kind of mad because the child's making a big mess. But I also am excited because the child is showing interest in doing the laundry and the child is trying to do the laundry. They may not be doing it very well and they may not be doing it right, but they want to help. So the, the Maya mom sees the motivation, the child's motivation is very pro-social, very like kind of the way the, the, the psychologist sees the toddler moving the furniture, you know, that the, this is yeah. I, the child wanting to help and they don't know how. Um, and so then there's actually studies that show like what the Maya mom does or the Maya dad does. And it's really incredible because it's like kind of what you said, it's not all of a sudden it becomes a lecture. Like, okay, now I'm going to show you how to do the laundry. You know, yeah. this is how you do it. You fold it like this. No, not like that. You know, grabbing from the child. The child is allowed to kind of do what they can with guidance from the parent. So they will tell them, you know, no, the clothes go in the basket. And the first thing will be like, put the clothes in the basket or the clothes go in the drawer. So they will correct the child, but it will be in a way that's like guidance for the child helping versus like criticism or punishment or, you know, you're doing it wrong. It's, oh, we're no. shooing away. We're shooing away. Your job. You go watch a video. I have laundry to do. Exactly. Right? Which is and that very is like, American. And that is probably the number one thing one of the anthropologists who cite in the book thinks is what extinguishes this helpful drive is the shooing yeah. away. Yeah. Because you're saying like this job, this task is not for you. This is for the, the adults. And they say right. that eventually the child, you know, believes you and says, yeah. this task is not for me. Yeah. Um, but accepting the child's help as the way they, they want to try to do it, that also is, the, that's the second huge key. Because, yeah. no, even adults, you don't like it if you're trying to do something and a person, you know, your boss comes in and says, oh, no, it's completely wrong. <laughs> that's not how you do it. And throw, chucks out your work, right? Like, how demotivating is that? Right? right. But if they say like, okay, you, you kind of got the hang of it here. Let's take this and we yeah. can kind of fix this. And build on that. Yeah. Exactly. Build on it. Exactly. Yeah. Versus resistance. Um, right. Right. So those I think are the two key things. It's like seeing the child as wanting to help and including right. them. And then two, accepting what they can do mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, accepting them as a member and accepting them as a partner in it, you know, yeah. Um, for Rosie, who's, you know, very, she's a firecracker, <laughs> you know, super strong willed, super <laughs> my way or the highway lady, you know, yeah. just accepting a little bit of what she does then makes her so much more helpful and cooperative. Then she starts yeah. listening, you know, she's like, oh, this person's on board with me. I'll get on board with them, you know? Yeah. Yep. So we're talking a lot about moms and, and a little bit dads too, but you also write that um, parenting really throughout history and throughout other cultures has been a multi-generational affair. Um, and in fact, that the idea of the nuclear family, um, you called it one of the most non-traditional structures out there, right? That for 
percent of the time that humans have been on earth um there was no such thing so talk, talk a little bit more about that yeah it is definitely like the most non-traditional um yeah, the nuclear family, again, is, is one of those really weird things that we do. Very strange. Um, Acronym and, weird? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And weird, like you can't find it. I mean, um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not talking about places that have like industrialized, you know, the Western culture is has a lot of fingers everywhere. So um, yes, so absolutely. If you look throughout human history, children have been raised by a and actually, this is probably some of the strongest evolutionary biology is in this part of the book. Um, there's a fantastic evolutionary biologist, Sarah Blaffer Hardy, has, who has studied this really well, looking at other primates and then looking at modern day hunter gatherer groups, which, you know, humans spent um, almost their entire existence as hunter gatherers. And there's, there's quite a few, like hundreds of hunter gatherer, modern hunter gatherer groups around the world. And they give us a little, shed a little bit of light on, you know, what, what that was like, um, you know, what people do and how people act in a hunter-gatherer context. And with these two pieces of evidence together, um, Sarah Balfour Hardy really has come up with this idea that children, human children evolved to be raised by about five or six people. Um, and we're talking about real caretakers, not just people yeah. that kind of move in, but like as much as in like a mom and dad here. And her argument is that if you look at how, um, how helpless human babies are. I mean, we are really undercooked when we come out of the yes. oven. Um, yes. And that, they, that a mom and a dad just couldn't do it. They couldn't mm -hmm. feed the child. They couldn't take care of the child. And so you have this being that has evolved to be around, you know, a mom, a dad, a grandmother, an older sibling, a neighbor, you know, and you go look around the world and you just see everywhere you go, um, everywhere I've been, you know, kids are really close to at least four, five, six people, and sometimes more, sometimes 10. Um, and that's one of the starkest contrasts is when, when, we, when Rosie and I came back from these trips, I forgot to mention, we also went to Tanzania um, in, with this hunter-gatherer group, the Hadzabe. And when we come back from these trips, that's what just hits me in the face. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm doing, me and my husband are doing this job that really five people should be doing. Right. And we're no wonder we're exhausted on you know saturday and sunday night you know um yeah. and we do i mean we do still even though we think the nuclear family is this like ideal thing at the end of the day we do still have what's called these allo parents right the school system nannies neighbors friends you know we just kind of i think overlook them or, or not don't value or give them enough privilege in the child's life they are so important mm -hmm. for the child and studies have shown that over and over again one or two extra adults that care about a child can protect a child from anxiety and depression and make a huge difference because that is what the kid is really made to be raised by um and i should also say in in many hunter modern day hunter gatherer communities the the child care is 50 50 um mm -hmm. in terms of what the nuclear family the nuclear parents do the parent the dads play a huge 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 role huge role in it well and i don't think that parents in weird cultures, acronym weird, are encouraged to value those allo parents that you mentioned. It, um, it, if anything, I think we're made to feel guilty for needing them or relying on them or turning to them as though um, it's sort of a weakness. You know, you yeah. should be able to handle this on your own. I mean, it's yeah. your problem if, you know, your work won't give you the time off, right? Or if you haven't set up your savings in a way that, you know, you can be um present constantly for your child but god forbid you need to rely on babysitters or extended family like that's a weakness in our culture more than a strength to rely on others to help you raise you know to to create a village is just not valued i don't think here yeah i think it's actually even some it has been criticized right that right. like that the mom that goes and works is somehow doing a disservice to the children, right? right. Like, right. whereas in fact, if you look at evolutionarily, it's, it's more in line with how a child is meant to be raised. And, um, you know, there's a great, um, there's a great study that I'm thinking of now where, and I think this is a hunter gatherer group in the Philippines where the mom goes back to work. Um, I think this is fishing or something, you know, you know, 
like two weeks after the baby's born. Like, you know, this is just standard in the, in, you know, the older, the older um, women and men take care of the children, but this is just the way it goes. This is not, you know, she's got to go work and it's like, yeah. well, and there's, um, there's a lot of, and there's, there's benefit lot. to the child in that. It, it, exactly. Model, so, yeah. it, absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. Like it actually, even though we criticize it, I think it's actually probably arguably healthier for the child yeah. to have this, you know, intergenerational and being with other people. You know, there's a, there's some studies that look at how children a couple years older than a child are actually better at teaching a child a task than the parent, mm -hmm. because the, the, the older, the, the other child knows kind of where the younger child is and knows kind of right. what they need to do or the child makes it fun, whereas the parent makes it boring, you know, so there's like, yeah, yeah we totally devalue this. Um, and you, you can see it in your kids, like when your kid really bonds with another adult or another child, it's like gold, right? In our yeah. lives, it's like gold. It's, you know, because um, yeah. I think it's really meant, meant to be that way. I mean, it's kind of a scam, right? This <laughs> <Yeah. clear family. laughs> And one of the, one of the historians told me, you know, he said, it's also just not, there's not enough of a safety net. Yeah. Um, you know, that if something happens to the mom or the dad, you know, that, that, that the children kind of are kind of left in the lurch, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that evolution kind of built this much bigger safety net around, yeah. around kids um, and yeah. for the parents, right, too. Right, right. So um, let's uh, move into some of the steps you took, I found so interesting um, to, I, I think, make Rosie and, and encourage your readers to make their children more of um, just, again, a family member, part of a team, right? Yeah, and not yeah. so much this sort of separate um, being that lives in a separate world than the rest of their family. So you encourage parents to um, buy fewer toys, you know, actual something that only functions as a toy, right? Spend yes. less time at places that are specifically geared toward kids, right? I think you yes. would give us all permission to never, ever walk in another um, Chuck E. Cheese for the rest of our lives. So thank you yes. for that. <laughs> I don't know that you called it out by name, but I certainly took it as never have to go to Chuck E. Cheese again. No, don't um, do it. Don't, sorry, okay, Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, <laughs> so I did start wondering as I was reading, how much of our parenting and really honestly the way we experience being a family being part of a family is kind of ruled by the commodification of childhood mm. and of parenthood mm. um where you turn childhood and you turn parenthood into these distinct periods of time these distinct identities and then you market to them and you profit from them. Um, yes. Is there just a whole lot less of that in other cultures? Um, so to, number one, yes, you're absolutely right. You can see actually a lot of the weird stuff that we do happens to come about around, you know, really start changing around the time of industrialization. Um, um, and so, you know, super, they say, you know, suit kind of the supercharging of the production. So pre 1900s, like from like eight mid 1800s, no kids had toys, <laughs> like across the US, no matter who you were across social economic, no matter who across all spectrums, no kids had toys. And, you know, children made toys from wood, from cloth, from things outside, they made up their games. And this idea that you had to give a child a toy really came about when when people, when companies started making them at a mass scale and, and parents started having more money. So, um, absolutely that what we do is very tied into the capitalistic uh, machinery. And so the places that we went to in a lot of places in the world don't have a lot of extra money. The, the parents don't have a lot of extra money, but they do have enough money to like buy their kid a phone if they want to. <laughs> you know, or, you know, Nintendos and um, all these things. And they just don't, you know, the mm -hmm. Maya parents said a child can have a phone if they can pay for it, you know, and so mm -hmm. that the children don't get phones until the child can pay for the phone and pay for the service. And so uh, that ends up being like a 15, 16 year old who has a job, right? And mm -hmm. then has a phone. So I think the answer is yes, there's a lot less of that, because there is a lot less money. But 
in a lot of places, families are getting more money and, and you still don't see this, um, like, like, like we've bought into this idea. And, and I think it's kind of gotten a little bit out of control. Like, I think it's when I'm talking about the echo chamber, I think it's like, we don't hear another way. So right. one of the editors on the book said, you know, but, but giving a child a toy is how we show love. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, okay, but think about that, <laughs> right? I mean, think about how we've tied like a love to like something that costs money. And like, mm-hmm. you know, it, I think we've kind of lost sight of kind of, you know, whereas a lot of other places like up in the Arctic would be like, how do you show children love? Oh, you take them on a hunting trip. Right. You know, you, you take them fishing, you, you teach them how to sew, right? You spend yeah. time with the child. You welcome the child into your world. That is what children want to be. That's where they want to be. They, I think one of the major problems in our, in our lives with children and anxiety and loneliness and stress is because they're not truly connecting with their parents. And that connection is done through this welcoming them into your world. Right. Um, and it's not perfect. So for instance, the hunting trip, you know, little kids can't go seal hunting because they're too noisy. And one of the dads told me, you know, I said, well, what do you do? And he said, well, you kind of tell them you can't do it until you're quieter. And if they still push and they still push, then I'll take them out with an older kid um, and we'll park the sled far away and they'll have to hang out while I hunt. And that's training the child, right? To be quiet. It's training the child to be patient, to be outside. And then he said, slowly over the time, we'll move the sled closer and closer to the seal hole. And so it's this, I'm not saying no to you. I'm not saying, no, you can't join my world, but I'm saying there's some rules and you have to kind of build up to be able to do it. And to me, that's like way much more of a con- way of connecting with a child and showing love than like a toy, right? Or, yeah. or, you know, I mean, I think when we take them to these, to Chuck E. Cheese's and to the museums, we want that connection. But yeah. at the end of the day, that's not our world, right? That's, we're visitors there. And so, mm-hmm. um, I think that there's a dis- there's kind of a conflict and a tension that rises, right? Mm-hmm. Because if I don't want to be there, then Rosie knows that, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. So. That um, brings me to your uh, sort of delineation, I guess, between the, the the way you describe the difference between independence and mm. autonomy. Yeah. So, right, independence means not needing or being influenced by others, but autonomy um, leaves room for connectivity and yes. a responsibility yes. to others. And that seems like the goal, right? We want autonomous kids. We want, yeah. auto- you know, we want to be autonomous. We want connection and responsibility to others. So talk about how we get more of that into our kids' lives. Yeah, this is such an interesting topic. And this comes from a lot of um, work done with modern hunter-gatherer communities like the Hadzabe in the book. Um, if you look all around the world at hunter, modern hunter-gatherer communities, one of the key values in all of these places is autonomy. And this is the right to make your own decision. Um, so the, they grant this to everyone. And the last thing um, a person wants to do is tell another, pers- another person what to do. Um, and this is including children. So um, th- they feel like, and, and you can make a good argument again that this is the way children evolve to be raised. Um, they feel like children have the right to make their own decisions from moment to moment. But there are kind of, like you said, the, a little bit of structure around that in that the child must be kind, right, to each other. The child must be generous. So very early on, they teach children to share, like, um, toddler up, they teach the child to share. And so th- this is expected that you get something, you share it. Um, and the child must help out whenever possible. So that accommodito, right? Accommodita. Um, and so it's not just like independence, like you say, it's, it's this freedom, but you also are always turning back to the group and looking to the group and wanting to help the group. And I mean, a lot of cultures, um, this is what's thought of as a good family member. You don't boss other people around. You don't tell them what to do and you do your own thing, but you're constantly looking to help each other. Um, and, and so how do we do that? I think, 
I think two ways are number one. Number one, we start to become aware of how much we boss our children, children around. <laughs> For me, this was really shocking. I actually took my phone one day and like recorded it. I started recording. I actually did it for my job with my for NPR by accident one day. I recorded like two hours of me and Rosie. And I realized that and I went back and listened to it. It was so instructive. I was like telling her to do something like every minute, you know, like either a command or an instruction or an explanation or praise, lots of praise. Um, and in many hunter gatherer communities, parents will say like one or two things an hour. And those things will be reserved for those rules. So come, come carry this stick, you know, grab the machete. That's one of the <laughs> actual ones in the study, you know, go, go, go run this errand, go pick some herbs, go do this. So, so one or two commands an hour and therefore like helping others or sharing, share this, share this um, muffin with your, with your, with your brother. Um, so one of the things we can do to give kids a time is just to stop telling them what to do, <laughs> you know, and try this like one or two commands an hour, especially in like settings where you have a lot of conflict. So the mornings, the, e the evenings. Yeah. Um, that time. Yeah. And what that does is it, it, it gives, it tells the child, I have confidence in you. Knew. I have confidence that you know what to do. And it doesn't mean you can't give them looks or use all these nonverbal tools that we talk about in the book, but, but, it's how, but you're telling the child, like, I have confidence in you. And the child starts to take initiative, starts to make their own decision and starts to build confidence. And the second thing we can do is kind of what I alluded to, to keep them turned into the group and thinking about the group and paying attention to others is to then give them small tasks of what you're doing. So you're in the kitchen cooking, um, you know, you're letting the child do what they want to do. Maybe they're coming over every now and then and you say, hey, Rosie, run upstairs and get me some herbs from the, from the porch or grab this from the refrigerator. You know, so these, you know, little tiny small tasks of what you're doing um, will teach the child, one, how to do the task, help teach the child to cook, that'll bring the child into cooking. Um, but two, it will teach them to be cooperative and it will teach them to keep looking towards the group. How can I help? How can I be a help? And these are great, this is great for adults too. You know, if you have an adult, <laughs> it doesn't really help out instead of being like, it's your turn to make dinner or like, why aren't you helping? Hey, right. come over here and like cut these herbs, you know, yeah. and let's do this, do, do things as a group. So instead of make, you know, go make your bed, let's all make the beds together. Let's yeah. all do these tasks together. And then um, kids love it. Kids want to help and they want to work as a team and they want to be with you yeah. in your world, you know, share yeah. together. So. I'm glad you brought that up, the part about adults. Julie Lipkat Hames, right, who we all love. She's yes. phenomenal and, and writes brilliantly about older kids um, and how to raise successful adults. Um, who don't need you to like call them at college to wake them up for the classes, <laughs> um, <laughs> blurbed your book. She's yeah. on the back of your book. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see some of the lessons that you gleaned um, playing out as Rosie gets older, or maybe for people in the audience who, who whose kids are older. Yeah, I mean, I've experimented a lot with it. Um, probably the most um, with my husband. <laughs> Because like, you know, I like learned all this stuff and then I was like, you know, how am I going to implement this? Because, you know, he hasn't learned it. And, um, but what I've realized is that it, I think like 95% of the stuff in the book works with adults and, and older children. Actually, we, we had uh, um, the pleasure of taking care of a nine-year-old for a while and I tested so much out on her and she was, she had never been asked to do anything in the kitchen or really anything. And the first couple of times I would ask, oh, come over here and peel this potato. You know, she looked at me like I was crazy, but like after <laughs> like a week, like she was super into it and you yeah. could tell like she was really enjoying it. And I think I think the key thing, I mean, with little kids, it's key too, but I think with older kids and adults is even more important is, is what I talk a lot about in the book of not forcing it, right? Yeah. So it's this encouragement. And again, that's respecting autonomy. That's for, you know, so with these encouragements, it's like, come on over and help me. It, you know, it's like, oh, it's time. We're going to do this together. Other. Um, you know, and explaining to the child why, why it's important. Like, you know, if we don't wash your clothes, are you going to wear stinky clothes to school? You know, I mean, kind of not just making the assumption that the child or, you know, older children too understand why it's important and what, you know, and then acknowledging their contributions. Thank you. That was really helpful. I, you know, look how much faster it went when we did it together, you know, and kind of make acknowledging to them the importance and 
and, and, you know, um, how useful it is when we work together, the value of working together. Because in American parenting, the number one thing is independence. If you interview American parents, they say independence, independence, independence. But at the end of the day, if you want your children to be collaborative and cooperative with you, you also have to value cooperative work. And, right. and you know, it has to be prioritized a little bit. Um, so a lot of the section in the book um, about the tools, I think are great for older kids. So one of the things with Inuit parenting, one of the goals of Inuit parenting is to trigger thought in a child. So instead of telling the child what to do, like do and don't, they, I rarely heard this. I never heard this from the Inuit parents. They will tell the child the consequences of their action. You're going to hurt, you know, Rosie's sitting there juggling rocks and, you know, you're going to hurt somebody with those rocks, Rosie. Um, or, you know, the milk is left out on the counter. The milk's going to spoil if you leave it out, you know? And so I think that these things, these, these tools, I think are really good with, with older children. And um, because if you look at studies, young children get a lot of commands. So that three, two to three commands an hour with young children, it's higher. And with older children, it's less. And so the idea is that as children get older, they should be told less what to do because they know. Um, but if they don't know, then we just have to be kind of gentle with them. And, um, yeah. but I think the same of what rules apply, include people, include everyone, accept everyone's contribution, right? Like no spouse likes it if you're like, that's not how you cook the beans. <laughs> <laughs> And you go in and you do it yourself. Watch you know? a video. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we could cook the beans that way, or we could try to add this to it. You know, it's yeah. it's a it's a level of respect yeah. and valuing the other person's contribution. Right. right? Yep. Totally. Um, okay, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to leave a few minutes for audience questions. But um, and, and this is it's about the book, but it's also about you, I guess. You um, you. You write um, a few times about growing up in in a pretty volatile household yeah. um, where there was a lot of yelling and and escalating things, I guess, and yeah. and how you sort of reflexively started down a path of raising um, Rosie in that same kind of climate. And I wonder if in your research, as you learned more about what children need and and sometimes don't get and and what happens when when children don't get what they need um, or get things that aren't helpful um, I wonder if if that helped you offer yourself more grace about oh. some of the hardest parts of parenting because parenting's hard like if it, if it made it so that I'm I'm easier on myself mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> um I so did you look so. at yourself as a child who maybe didn't get the model yeah. you needed or or the answers you needed? Yeah, I think so. I think it um I think it made me realize not just me, but how like a lot of people in weird cultures aren't taught. Um, and I definitely, me personally, I was definitely not taught how mm -hmm. to collaborate with people. Mm -hmm. I was really not taught that. I was taught through schooling and my parents and my my family, how to compete with each other, how to kind of get what you want, no matter what, at the expense of relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think that left me, um, to be completely honest, a very lonely place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, lonely in my job, lonely in my family. And, um, and I think what the book has done and this travel has done is taught me how to really value and collaborate with people. And I say, I tell people like, Rosie's one of my favorite people in the world now because I really know how to work together with her. Like yeah. we really collaborate. And that's a rare thing in my life to have yeah. somebody that, that like you said, can build off of each other's ideas. And like, and, and so I do think that it's made me see kind of the deficiency in, in how we raise children. And the, a big, big one is, is, working together instead of trying to control. I think we right. come into relationships trying to control the relationship and to control each other. And then, and, and that's it makes, makes things really hard and, and, yeah. and keeps us from connecting. Um, uh, yeah, I think over time I've become less hard on myself too, because I just realized that actually, if I just do less, 
Rosie's going to be better off. <laughs> you know, like that. I just sometimes I wake up in the morning when we were with the Hadzabe, I woke up one morning. I was just like, damn, Michaeline, you are just trying too hard. Like you're just making it too hard, you know, yeah. like literally we would go get firewood or we go dig for tubers or go get water. And one of the moms would just say to Rosie, like, carry this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like, it's you know, not or, on a short chart. No. <laughs> just carry it. it was like she just walked past, she's like, carry this bottle, you know, or like yeah. we'd be down at the water pit, she'd go, go get that branch. Or like, you know, it would just be, and I was just like, wow, it's that easy, you know? Yeah. Like it literally is like, go get this, you know, and like that's it. And if the kid does it, one of the one time the kid was like a it was like a teenager, she didn't do what the mom was asking. And I was like, she's not doing it. And the mom said something like, oh, sh well, she'll do something later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, well, what kind of, that's an amazing attitude, right? Yeah. If somebody doesn't do anything and you're like, it's all right, she's, she'll do it later, yeah. you know? So I think that's what I've realized. Just at the end of the day, just, just, just stop doing things because mm -hmm. they know, they know way more than we realize right. how to grow and learn. You know, in, in some cultures, the word for teaching and learning is the same because it's it comes from the child not from from the, the adult yeah mm, i like that yeah i do too uh, heidi and michaeline i really uh, enjoy this conversation michaeline you have a, a very um wonderful energy obviously i like that uh, your ability to both laugh at yourself and laugh at this uh the circumstance that many um at least american parents western parents find themselves in so I'm sure that those watching, especially maybe those struggling, are appreciating. Uh, maybe, <laughs> unless they're like, "But you don't understand." Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. But, I know so it's I, hard. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to make a quick note that we are going to do a great after hours. Both Heidi and Michaelina will both be at after hours. So come join. Buy this book. This book is a great book, as you can see. Uh, lots of things to learn in there. Um, plenty to learn, and we're going to be having a, a really robust and lively conversation. Camera's on and you can ask your own questions uh, right at, you know, as soon as we finish this. Um, both Michaeline and Heidi will have about a five minute break in between um, this webinar and the start of After Hours, but we'll be starting at about 8.05. So with no further ado, let me ask a couple questions here from the yeah. audience. We'll go with the crowd favorite. So Debbie says, um, her she got some upvotes here. How much does individual temperament affect a child's desire to help family members? Two children raised similarly in the same family can have very different responses to parental expectations for helping. Yeah, I think it can be huge. Um, and I think parents, I've asked parents this question and they say, you know, every kid is different and some of them you have to push a little more than other ones. Um, but that said, I think one of the mom, the Maya moms, um, Teresa, she told me, she said, you know, each child has their own kind of spots where they shine and and she told me she said you know little six-year-old uh, Juanita or her little six-year-old she says you know she comes home and she does her homework right away and so we all look to her <laughs> to show us how to do the homework you know and so it was really it really stuck with me because it was this idea of like yeah they're all different and they all some will want to help more than others but maybe it's like you just haven't seen you know where they really want to contribute and I think paying attention to where they want to contribute and building off of that may be more important than kind of comparing like how much they want to contribute because I I I think all of them want to contribute, but maybe in different different ways. Um, Rosie is our egg scrambler in the home, and she also is is in charge of making the birthday cards because I am terrible at it, as you guys know now. Fan, I'm a horrible logistics person. But Rosie knows. <laughs> Rosie knows. Like, no one knew that. That was that was behind the scenes, Michael. And your secret I know, was. I know. I know. Like, was safe I, with us. Yes. It's okay, but it's a good example where like Rosie helps. She's like, it's cousin Charlotte's birthday, and she's like, I'm making the card, and sometimes she makes the cards and I don't even know it. So it's like find where the child wants to excel and help and then focus on that is what I would think my mom would tell you. <laughs> um, okay, so Jennifer comments, it's not necessarily a question, but she's commenting, can you create a Facebook group? I assume you by you, she means you. I certainly hope you don't mean me, Jennifer, full schedule. Uh, Jennifer wants to know, I'm Michaeline, can you create a Facebook group for fans of Hunt Gather Parent? So oh. that parents could exchange strategies and stories about implementing this advice. So that's a note to you. That's a great like, idea. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so Jennifer, great idea. Uh, Caitlin asks, can you describe the shift in your relationship with Rosie and how it evolved over time? And then interestingly, I like the second part of her question. I'm curious about your husband's collaboration and response to your research. 
and how important this has been in the development of her relationship with you both? Great question, Caitlin. So she first is, how has our Rosie and I's relationship? How, has, how does your, describe the shift in your relationship with Rosie oh, and how it yeah. evolved over time? Okay, I think the key thing with Rosie and I's relationship, there are two things. One, it was me stop getting angry at her. Um, at least stop at the amount of time. Once I stopped really caring, like when she was really misbehaving and just really not caring um, and having tantrums, I just, um, you know, I was there. I was there, but I stopped meeting her emotional outburst with an emotional outburst of myself. This is, we didn't really talk about this part, but this is a huge part of it. So kind of when her energy is high, I started going really low. This shifted us hugely because I became like this kind of rock for her instead of this like chaos swirling. The second thing was when I started accepting her contributions, like um, Heidi mentioned, and I started saying, okay, the kebab you just made, complete wreck, but yes, we'll take it. And then now let's try to make another one. And lo and behold, she starts to become more, so really valuing and welcoming and accepting her contribution. Not perfectly, mind you, I'll tell you, you gotta make the kebab a little bit different, but at least, okay, that's the start, that's the start. Um, those mm -hmm. were the two things that really changed us. And now, like I say, she's one of my most favorite people because we collaborate. Um, my and relationship with my husband, question. yes. Yep, exactly there. Yeah, go ahead. It is the best that it has ever been. This is gonna be fun. <laughs> because again, I have learned how to collaborate with him and respect his autonomy, but not give up, not throw out my hands and say, you're gonna do whatever. Slow, constant, gentle pressure. <laughs> this is how kids change and this is how relationships change. Not with loud, angry hammers. Um, so Ooh. yes, okay. you can ask my uh, husband. The, the, at one point he said, we can never go back to the old way, Michael. And I was like, we can never go back to the old way. Uh, <laughs> well, I hope maybe he'll join us in after hours if he's free. <laughs> Let's bring, bring Rosie, bring the whole family. Uh, Lydia asks, how can you let them be autonomous while also making sure what they uh, they do what needs to be done for example homework chores get ready for bed etc yeah so how do you balance it's a really really good question chaos i guess you know one of the the researchers the maya psychologist told me that um anything you force a child to do they will cede the responsibility to the adult for that so one of the studies looked at children taking initiative in the home and doing chores voluntarily but it also looked at homework and in, interestingly, when children are given, encouraged and not forced to do chores, so welcomed, asked to, but not forced, using a lot of the stuff that's in the book, they are also more likely, they're more likely to take initiative and volunteer chores, but they are also more likely to take initiative and do their homework. So part of a parent's responsibility in many cultures is to teach the child to take initiative. So there are many things you can do to encourage you can tell the child, you know, why it would be of their the benefit to do their homework. Why, you know, you can you can you can say you got to do this before you go outside to play. You can do these things, but if you force the child, they will cede the responsibility to the parent, and um, it'll be harder and harder to get the child, many children to do it. I don't know if that answers your question, but that it's a yeah, that's a good answer. We have time for one more. We're at seven fifty nine, so we have time for one more. It's from Anna. She says, "How about adopted children?" Did you find any differences in integrating them to the family, particularly those that are a bit older, let's say over three or four years old? This is a fantastic question. So in the Inuit culture and many, many cultures, kids don't have to stay with their nuclear family. And kids, because the nuclear family is not so central, many kids are adopted and move around and it's no big deal. And actually Canada actually changed the laws up there that they don't have to go through the adoption process because it's such a fluid thing. So one of the families we stayed with actually had just adopted a 12 year old who had decided he didn't want to stay with his parents anymore. And he went and he lived with this woman, Maria, who's in the book, um, because he loved being with her and she was teaching him all these Inuit skills. Um, and so it is, there's no stigma, right? There's no with you can go stay with your aunt you can go you know or i'm having this baby and my aunt's taking care of it now you know my aunt's gonna take it my grandmother's gonna take it um it's just this kind of thing that we all help each other out especially these extended families um in fact one of the women in the book nelly told me she said you have to have another baby and i'll take care of it until it's three because i take care of the toddlers <laughs> so it's just much much more oh. like open <laughs> and i said okay um, you can have the baby <laughs> 
my husband used to say like if they could arrive at four um you know you might have 10 but you exactly know, exactly and each one was like their specialty like nelly was really good with the babies and like so and so was good with the teenagers and so it's there's not these predefined roles that we think in many many cultures um it, and kids can decide like you don't get along with your parents then you know you don't have to stay there all right and on that note <laughs> I like that. If you don't get along with your parents, um, try another funny. one. <laughs> try another one. Find one. Find one you do get along with. I like that. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Heidi, another great interview. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to see these nice ladies in about five minutes in the after hours. Come join us. And Caitlin, if you are still watching, um, I know I double checked on registration. So please, I sent you an email. Check your email. Um, you have a little surprise in there. So thank you everyone for showing. I hope you come next week. Carol Anderson and Heather Cox Richardson. Woo! I'm gonna light that up right there. So very That'd different topic. It's gonna be a great night. So thanks everybody. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, thanks, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you, Heidi. See you in a minute. Thank you. Bye.